This is The Quest, a podcast from California's Assembly Democrats. Hello, this is Pablo Espinosa with Look West. On our new episode of Look West, a podcast from Assembly Democrats, we focus on COVID-19, the pandemic, where we are and where we're going. We talk to experts like Dr. Robert Wachter, chair of the Department of Medicine of UC San Francisco, and Dr. Shira Shafir, epidemiologist with the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. They both say that what we may be done with COVID, COVID may not be done with us. Joining us, though, to start is Assemblymember Jim Wood, chair of the Assembly Health Committee. So, Assemblymember, what do we know that we didn't know? Where are we? Some people say, well, we're done. COVID is all gone. But some of the flows like Dr. Shafir would say that we may be done with COVID, but COVID is not done with us. I would agree. I think that uh, as we see with this uh, with this virus, that it continues to change over time. And I would agree. I don't think COVID is done with us. I think we've we've done a lot uh, to take care of uh, risk for a lot of people, but I don't think it's over. And uh, I think uh, as we move into fall, and as our lifestyles change, and we're no longer outdoors as much as we were, I think uh, there's always the potential that we'll see um, more cases. Uh, fortunately, with so many people vaccinated now um, and, and boosted, uh, the severity of, of the disease uh, is, is greatly diminished, but the risk is still there. And uh, with the variants that, that seem to be popping up, um, we're going to be dealing with this for quite a while. At the federal level, in the past few days, the, the Biden administration has now focused on we making decisions individually. What are your thoughts regarding that new approach? Well, I hope that people won't be cavalier about this, quite frankly, and I hope that people will continue to take precautions and and be respectful of others, especially uh, people who might be more vulnerable. Um, Once again, you know, a lot of this, uh, in uh, from my perspective, is 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 that yeah, you may not have this. condition. Um, but you, if you are exposed to somebody and you do become someone who, who could potentially transmit this, think about the person who's less, who's, who's less able to resist the, the disease and the conditions and, and be respectful of that. We shouldn't be just changing our behaviors. We should still continue to wash our hands and, and, and all the things we've been doing uh, you know, for, for months and years now. What are your thoughts regarding the challenge in, in, in getting accurate data? Because the number of cases, a lot of the experts that are reported publicly, they say it does not reflect the reality because one of the main reasons they say is a lot of us are doing the take at home tests and those don't have to be reported. But we're using um, wastewater to get a much better idea, but that is not something that we use to make our everyday decisions. It would be great if everybody would report the cases. I think it would be uh, valuable. First of all, we've got to make sure if that happens. It's really, really easy uh, to do. But people are, you know, reluctant to, you know, divulge personal medical information, and I, I can understand that. Um, but uh, we do have the way of using wastewater surveillance, and we can actually see through that where we're seeing surges and where we're seeing uh, that that the virus is actually uh, diminishing and the effects of the virus is diminishing. And so I think we'll be using that science uh, more and more to track what's going on and inform our decisions because it's, you know, not everybody's going to report whether they, if, they, if they've got a positive test. So where are we as a state right now in terms of our approach? I know that uh, you have been expecting a briefing from the administration and that it, it is forthcoming. But uh, where are we? What are the plans? What, what are the next steps? I'm looking forward to that briefing. I do think we're in good shape. I, I think that um, the number of people who are vaccinated and boosted is, is high. Um, so people who are getting COVID are not being hospitalized at the rates that we would have expected um, before. We still have people that are being hospitalized. We still have people that are dying of COVID. Um, but those numbers um, are you know steady and decreasing. So that's, that's a positive for us. And and I think that uh, there will be um, there will be another booster uh, likely in the fall, uh, and um, and that's going to be really important. I think this is one of those conditions, kind of like the flu, where people should begin to expect that you're going to you know, you're likely to need uh, you know like a flu shot or a COVID shot, uh, you know, in the fall, like we do with the flu. I think that's I think that's our potentially our future. I'm sure Dr. Wachter might have. A more enhanced perspective on that, but I don't think this is going away. 
in talking about the next booster, uh, you know, some were saying, well, I want to go get him, go ahead and get the booster now, even though the new one is coming up in September. Some were saying, oh, you should wait. Uh, what are your thoughts regarding that? I'd say that's a decision that you should make with your doctor, quite frankly. And, uh, and I think a lot of it is about timing, you know, and when did you get the, when did you get the first booster? Uh, and, and so there is immunity with that. And so it's really a timing issue. And I think that's a, and, and a risk issue. And I think that's a, that's a uh, conversation you need to have with your doctor and make the best, the best decision for you. And Dr. What, um, Dr. Wachter and Dr. Shafir have shared publicly that they've had, you know, Dr. Wachter's wife got COVID. Um, she's a journalist and, you know, he's here, he is a preeminent expert, so no one is immune. And Dr. Shafir's young son got COVID, so they had to postpone, postpone a visit with her elderly mother. It, well, how about you? Uh, you know, it, in an article, I think it was Wall Street Journal, said that a lot of us probably got it, we just don't know it. You know, um, I, I haven't had it to the best of my knowledge. Um, I've been I've been careful uh, as well. Although, you know, I've got colleagues that have been extremely careful um, and family members who have been extremely careful who've gotten it. And so um, I don't know, there must there may be some host susceptibility issues. Um, but fortunately, I don't believe I've had it. I haven't had a cold or any symptoms of anything like that in probably three years, which is which is unusual for 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 me anyway. So so I feel very, very fortunate, but um, we'll see, you know, in, in time, do I ultimately get it? Um, you know, if, like I said, I've had family members who've been very careful who've gotten it. Uh, so they're, you know, it's just, you know, it's going to be, it's really about exposure, uh, time, you know, time in, in contact with that person and susceptibility. And so far it hasn't gotten me, um, but it, it, it very well could. And yeah, we all have to be careful and it depends on, on, on the individuals. But what about this uh, differences? Are there any between urban and rural areas? That's an interesting question. And I think early on uh, in a lot of our rural communities, mine is a very large rural district. And uh, um, we were seeing less, you know, less, fewer cases uh, in general in these and in these uh, sort of smaller communities that are uh, further away from other large population centers. And so I think early on, there was a little bit of a sort of laissez-faire sort of attitude about this and, and people were not as serious. Later on with Delta and Omicron, uh, we've seen um, pretty significant spikes uh, in, in some of our counties. And we also have lower vaccination rates because the cases, case numbers were lower. And so people felt, felt they were somewhat immune. Uh, that's pretty well been dispute, disproven now. And, you know, vaccination rates have climbed in some of the counties, but still in some counties, uh, rural California, uh, there is resistance to uh, vaccines and the, the number of cases uh, remains high by percentage. And so um, some of it's politics, personal beliefs, um, but early on, these rural communities were not getting, uh, seeing the number of cases we were in the large urban areas. And I think that sort of a false sense of security and that has been hard for people to get away from. Assemblymember Jim Wood, chair of the Assembly Health Committee, joining us in this episode of Look West. Don't go away. We're going to join Dr. Wachter and Dr. Shafir for their thoughts. Joining us now are Dr. Shira Shafir. She's an epidemiologist with UCLA's Fielding School of Public Health and Dr. Robert Wachter. He's the chair of the UC San Francisco Department of Medicine. Thank you both for, for joining us in this episode of Loop West. A pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting us. Dr. Wachter, we'll we start with you. And, and if you don't mind, I, I guess the question goes for both. Where exactly are we now with COVID? Because it seems one thing is clear to me, we really don't know everything that we need to know or, or that I think people like both of you guys would like to know about the virus? Well, we certainly understand the virus much, much better than we did two and a half years ago. I think the challenge for us now is we have to layer what we know about the virus, the extraordinary uh, steps that we've taken in terms of vaccines and therapeutics against a backdrop of an exhausted populace and people who really very much want to get back to their normal lives, are tired of restrictions. And, uh, and so a lot of the uh, guidance about what people might want to do, given the current state of the virus and the threat, is falling on at least partly deaf, deaf ears. So that's complicated. It's also complicated in that the risk of transmission 
and the risk of getting COVID probably has never been higher. Maybe it's a little bit better now than it was two or three weeks ago, but, but it's really quite, quite high. The risk of dying of COVID has gone down tremendously, particularly if you are vaccinated and boosted. And so people have a hard time sort of keeping that split screen view uh, you know, straight. There's a lot going on and a lot of three-dimensional chess that we have to play. And Dr. Wachter, you've said that you don't, you're not afraid of dying of COVID is what you said. If you don't mind, complete the thought. I, I, I like the idea that I've read about. Yeah, I, you know, I've had, I'm a healthy 64 year old guy. I have had four vaccine shots. I've not had COVID as far as I know. Um, the threat that I am going to die of COVID with four, with two, two vaccines and then two boosters in me is close to zero. It's not zero, but it's close to zero and close enough that it doesn't consume me anymore. That's very different from March, 2020, when I was hiding under my kitchen table. Uh, I still don't want to get COVID. And the reasons are a few. One is it will take me out of work and life for on average eight days or so. So that, and, and second, you know, I might have a fairly unpleasant time, but the bigger issue is long COVID. The bigger issue is someone who's fully vaccinated, my best, putting together of the literature is that I have about a one in 20 chance of having prolonged symptoms. My wife had that exactly three months after her case of COVID. She continued to have fairly bad exhaustion and a little bit of brain fog. So, so the main reason I don't want to get COVID is the possibility of, of, of prolonged symptoms and also a fair amount of research that's pointing to uh, a finding that says that people who've had COVID have a higher rate a year later a higher rate of heart attacks, a higher rate of strokes, a higher rate of diabetes. So when I put that all together, the threat, I think, for someone who's vaccinated and boosted is no longer really a, a tremendous fear that you're going to end up on a breathing machine and die of the acute case. Not a zero chance, particularly if you're older, or if you have other medical diseases, and absolutely uh, not, not true. I would be scared of a bad case if I was unvaccinated. But that's not my main fear. My main fear is the consequences of getting COVID, particularly long-term consequences. And Dr. Shafir, what, what are your thoughts and perspective regarding where are we? You know, it, it seemed that we saw a, a massive surge compared to what we had seen in December and January. And the numbers that at least are being reported may not be completely accurate for the part of the reason is people are testing at home. That's spot on. Uh, we had yesterday about 15,000 cases reported within the state of California, which is a lot. We also know that that is not accurate. Uh, and, and as you've correctly noted, a huge part of that is because we have encouraged people, we want them to test at home, but we don't have a mechanism when someone tests at home to uh, get notification of that positive rapid antigen test. So number one, we aren't getting the home test positives reported. And number two, a lot of people are choosing not to test at this point, either because they don't want to know if they have COVID or because they think, um, well, it couldn't possibly be COVID. It must be allergies. It must be just something else. So we know that uh, depending on that local health jurisdiction in the state, many of them are using multipliers between three and 10. So uh, in order to figure out how many cases they actually have within their jurisdiction. And we're using wastewater data to determine that a bit more accurately, certainly has gone up in Sacramento counties and San Francisco. And I think that you know over there in LA County, you guys were having some trouble in what is needed to test the water, but you know we know that it was also much higher, right? That's absolutely true. And the advantage of wastewater surveillance is that it doesn't have the same biases or um, um, deficits as compared to looking at reported cases from people who are sick. Um, as the popular children's book says, everybody pees, everybody poops. <laughs> we know that the virus uh, can be found. So we can look at our wastewater and that will tell us if the levels of virus are stable or they are rising. Um, and unfortunately, we are continuing to see increasing levels of virus in wastewater in most of the surveillance sites within the state of California. And, and while we're seeing that, though, we as a society, it seems like we just kind of have decided, as you were saying, Dr. Wacker, perhaps because we're just tired and it's a human aspect to, to all of us, to kind of turn the page. 
you know, and it seems that it, you know, the data doesn't really support turning the page completely. A lot of folks in our communities are carrying on as if we're absolutely past it and no one is immune. Certainly, you know, you, you know, if you guys don't care sharing, don't mind sharing. Dr. Wachter, your wife got it. Dr. Shafir, I hope your son has recovered. LA Times, when they did the story, August 1st, they said that, you know, he had tested positive. Mm -hmm. um, no one is immune. Yeah, the, you know, the, the, the data now, I mean, the last time, the CDC data I saw was from a couple of months ago, probably 75 or 80 percent of the population has had COVID by this stage. Uh, not everybody knows it. They may have had asymptomatic cases and not tested for it. Their problem is that, you know, some of the truths that we had several months ago are no longer holding. So I've known plenty of people who've gotten COVID who said, oh, darn it, I was trying so hard not to get it, but at least I got it out of the way. As if, all right, I've got it, I'm not gonna get it again. The problem is that you getting it, unfortunately, is no guarantee that you won't get it again. We're seeing more and more reinfections because the new variants uh, are not as respectful of the immunity that you had from a prior infection. And there, although a, a recurrent case or a repeat case may be milder than your first case, was a study that came out about a month ago that showed that people who have had multiple cases of COVID seem to have uh, worse long-term uh, outcomes. And so even if you've had it before, it's not a get out of jail free card. You still are vulnerable to getting another case and having another case is still potentially consequential. So it's very tricky. Of course, it's a human instinct. I feel it myself. I'd love to ditch the mask. I'd love to go back to make believe it's 2019, uh, but I'm still pretty careful because I still don't want to get it for the reasons I described. And Dr. Shafir, in LA County, this conversation about using masks or not, at least in indoor places, uh, was at the top of the, uh, of the page a few weeks ago. The decision was not to do it. Uh, what, whatever happened with all of that? Yeah, I think um, really highlighting what Dr. Walker has already said, that people are tired and really exhausted with having dealt with the pandemic for two and a half years, when the LA County Health Officer, Dr. Barbara Ferrer, looked at the data and it appeared as if new cases were stabilizing rather than increasing, I think they made uh, the decision not to re-implement an indoor mask mandate. Um, I think it is important uh, to still consider masking. Uh, in, in my personal circumstance, I don't go anywhere indoors without wearing a mask. Um, I have a four-year-old who, as you noted, recently got over COVID. The only place he actually goes indoors is preschool. And one of the reasons that we feel good sending him to this preschool is that they have, despite the fact that it is not mandated in LA County, they do require all of the children to mask except when they are sleeping and when they are eating and they take most of their meals and snacks outside. And despite all of that, because there is so much COVID transmission, he still did get infected. And um, in a surprise to no one who understands either epidemiology or parenting, once he got infected, that uh, meant that I got infected. And, and so we had days and days where he wasn't able to attend school, where I wasn't able to work. So I think it is important um, to distinguish between is masking being mandated, and at this time in LA County and throughout the state, it is not. And is it advisable? And I, I think the answer to that question is unequivocally, absolutely. I love the fact that you say unequivocally, absolutely, because I think that it's getting lost in the headlines and in the coverage uh, regarding mandate. You know, sure, it is not mandated, but should you do it? Is it wise to do it? Clearly, both of you guys are well-respected experts and you guys are saying yes, for sure. Um, how do we counter that? Because the public, sure, yeah, they're tired, but um, I, I think more voices need to, I mean, the LA Times and the San Francisco Chronicle did a great job in having your guys' uh, opinions out there. But I think repetition maybe is the key, right? Because, you know, even in, in, in the circles in Sacramento, uh, the idea is that, oh, we know, we're past it. 
Yeah, I guess I'm, uh, I think it is a very important to distinguish between mandates and recommendations. And I, I really am not in favor of mandates at this time because I think individuals now have the capacity to keep themselves safe through vaccinations, boosting, and choosing to wear a mask yourself. Um, you know, the, the N95s or the equivalents are quite good. I take care of patients in the hospital who I know have COVID and very little hospital transmission has occurred. So it's not like the early days where none of us had the tools to keep ourselves safe. I think it is important in a society like ours, particularly, you know, one that has a pretty decent sized libertarian streak to use mandates sparingly. And I think we needed them absolutely in the early days. Today, I think the threshold for mandates should be that the hospitals are getting overwhelmed. And they're not at this point. We're actually more threatened by staff absences by doctors and nurses who are out because of COVID than we are because we're being overwhelmed. So if it ever got to the point the hospital was being packed again with COVID patients, then I think mandates are appropriate. But I do think recommendations are, are important. And I'm not particularly critical anymore of someone who chooses not to mask as long as they're doing it with their eyes open. I think if you have, you know, if you look at all the information and you say, I'm willing to get COVID, it's just such a bummer to continue to wear a mask and to continue to, 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 to live this life that we've been living for the last couple of years. I get it. It's not a choice that I make. I, you know, the choice I make is I don't want to get COVID and wearing a mask on an airplane or wearing a mask in a crowded supermarket just doesn't seem like that big de a deal to me. I mean, it's not chemotherapy. And so I, you know, I think to be cavalier and say, I don't really care if I get COVID. I think that's, that's sort of avoiding the reality of it's, you know, it's still something you would, it would be great not to get it if you can take fairly simple steps in order to avoid it. And to me, wearing a mask in a crowded indoor space is a fairly simple step. You know, I get an airplane and I see three quarters of the airplane not wearing a mask. Given the current case rates in an airplane with 100 people, I can virtually guarantee that there is someone on that airplane who has COVID and it is infectious. And I always fantasize, what if the flight attendant called up a sign as I was getting on, we can guarantee there's someone on this plane who has COVID is infectious. I think the mask rate where the mask wearing rate would go up, but of course they don't do that. I love the Dr. Walker using that example because it it is so clear and so true. I think there's an interesting difference in perspective you see from a, a clinician like Dr. Walker and a public health practitioner like myself, because I look at it and come at it from the perspective, all right, so if someone decides they don't want to get COVID, that is absolutely their personal choice. But from a public health perspective, we think about, but what about the population? So what about if I've decided I don't want to get COVID, but the person next to me in the supermarket has decided they don't care about wearing a mask and they have COVID and are unaware. So I think that um, that's why when asked unequivocally, absolutely, masks are, they're advisable, they are likely necessary. Um, I, like Dr. Walker, I fall on the side of, I'm unclear about the utility of the mandate itself, because a mandate without enforcement is meaningless. And unfortunately, we don't have the, the resource right now for enforcement of mask mandates. But I really think about masking, not just from the, do I need a mask to protect myself? That part, I think, is is very clear. But should I wear a mask as a good citizen in order to protect the others um, who might be around me, who might not have a competent immune system, who might be in a household with someone who is at a higher risk of disease? And, and that was your household, because when your four-year-old son was infected, you know, tell us you were planning a visit to your 70-year-old mom. Yeah, the well, she the, was planning to visit you. She was planning to to visit here. My husband and I had PCR'd. My mother had done her PCR. Everybody was negative. And the morning of her visit, uh, we did a rapid test on my son, who had maybe the tiniest little runny nose, um, no fever. He really was not um he, he was not obviously sick. We tested him, and I remember my husband saying, you know, 
because uh, I'm I'm the one who I'm the official household rapid tester. <laughs> and uh, and the policy in our house had been you don't look at it for 15 minutes because otherwise we'd end up staring at the tests. And he looked down and he said, I think this test is broken. There's there's two lines. And I just remember feeling absolutely panicked and thought, it's not broken. Our kid has COVID, um, which meant calling my mother immediately and saying, don't go to the airport. You can't come. Um, you know, epidemiologists are very, we, we caveat everything, right? Someone once said that our official motto would be, it depends. We never want to be absolute. And yet, if my mother had flown here, and come to our house, she would have been unmasked because she had tested negative. And um, I feel nearly certain that my mother would have gotten infected. My son would have been on her lap, giving her kisses. Um, and she's she's 70. I, I'm not willing to take a risk that, uh, that she's going to get infected and potentially end up very ill. Well, thank you both for your wisdom and willing to share it. And before uh, parting, tell me just briefly your thoughts about monkeypox. I mean, to this week, uh, this past week, we just had a hearing, uh, the first hearing in the legislature regarding that. Uh, the state has declared a state of emergency as has the country. Um, is this a reason to be extremely concerned the way we were a few years ago with COVID or can you put it in perspective? Yeah, I would, I would say the level of concern can be lower because at least so far in the United States, there has not been a fatality. And so COVID very quickly was clear, it was clear that this could easily be a fatal disease and has killed over a million people. That's not the threat with monkeypox. On the other hand, it's growing quickly. It's a little bit disconcerting that you would think our muscle memory after the last two or three years would be pretty good. Okay, another epidemic threat. Um, we now what to know what to do in terms of making available testing and uh, vaccination and treatment and recommendations and public communication. And it still seems we're not that good at it, which is which is somewhat concerning. It it you know it's interesting because I worry a little bit that after COVID we will catastrophize every infectious disease threat. Um, you know, prior to COVID, we under, we underplayed them because we had seen four or five or six threats in the prior 15 or 20 years that none of which came out to be as bad as we feared. Now, after COVID, we're going to be worried that everyone is going to be another COVID. I don't think this is another COVID, but it's real. It's certainly a threat to certain populations at this point, mostly men who have sex with men. It requires a very vigorous response by public health community, by legislatures and all that. Uh, but it probably not COVID in terms of the level of overall threat. I, I would agree with Dr. Walker. This is not COVID in terms of the level of overall threat. This is an infection that we measure its impact by its morbidity rather than its mortality. And I think it's important to note, we have not seen a, a fatality in the United States, and that is very important. By the same token, the individuals who are infected are uh, reporting excruciating pain and they can be sick for um, weeks. And so we really have to be mindful of what can and should the response be. Where we do have some of those reverberations of, of COVID that I think Dr. Walker began to reference, we are limited in our vaccine supply at this time. We are limited in our therapeutic options at this time. And we do still have some limited testing capacity. It is really important to note, uh, as Dr. Walker pointed out, over 90% of the cases that we have seen throughout the world in this particular outbreak have been in men who have sex with men. And it really is being driven at this time by sexual transmission. So we want to ensure that we are making that information available. We are educating the population at greatest risk while also um, taking great care not to be homophobic in our response, not be sex negative in our response and in our materials and education. I think there are some really exciting potential developments with the federal declaration of a state of emergency. They're beginning to do some trials to see 
if the existing vaccine could be administered a little bit differently, which would um, increase the supply we have about fivefold because they could use one fifth as much vaccine. The declaration of the state of emergency does make it possible to begin manufacturing more of the, the therapeutic, the TPOX drug that um, doesn't prevent transmission, but it does really help to um, help individuals who are infected uh, clear the infection much faster. So I, I think it's not COVID, but it is definitely something we want people to be aware of. We want those who are at highest risk um, to be mindful. And um, we want to make sure that our messaging is reaching the most appropriate populations while not causing unnecessary panic in those who are unlikely to get infected um, and, and therefore uh, unlikely to need the resources we currently have that are limited. And Dr. Shafir and Walter, in this world of sound bites, uh, let's close with what would you like the folks that listen to this episode to walk away with, particularly focused on COVID? I think particularly focused on COVID, we may be done with COVID. COVID is not done with us. We have to be incredibly appreciative at the remarkable pace with which science and medicine have worked over the last two and a half years. It is nothing short of a scientific miracle. And yet, um, it still takes time to do science. And so there is likely still more information we are going to learn and we need to adapt our knowledge and adapt our responses as this information becomes available to us. And mask wearing and vaccines absolutely work. Yeah, I guess I would emphasize the vaccinations at, at this point. Um, the vaccination will not prevent you from getting COVID, but it will prevent you from getting very sick and dying from COVID. If you've not had a vaccine shot in 2022, then your immunity is insufficient uh, and uh, you're not as protected as you can be and, and you need to be and the vaccines are safe and effective. And so uh, it is important to go out and, uh, and get vaccinated. Uh, and get boosted. I wish the CDC would stop saying people who've had two shots are, quote, fully vaccinated. I think that is, that's confusing. They are not. It's clear that the level of protection they have is actually quite underwhelming and that they could markedly ramp up their level of protection with one or two additional boosters. So I would go ahead and get it, go out today and get your booster if you have not gotten one in 2022. Dr. Robert Wachter, Chair of the UC San Francisco Department of Medicine, and Dr. Shira Shafir, epidemiologist with UCLA's Field and School of Public Health. Thank you both. A great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we want to join again uh, the Chair of the Assembly Health Committee, Assemblymember Jim Wood. Is there a relationship in terms of how we should look at monkeypox and COVID? Are we doing a good job so far? We didn't seem like prepare well enough at the national level for a vaccination supply. Um, what are your thoughts? Well, I don't think there's any question that we weren't ready at a national level for uh, for the for the mopox or whatever we're calling that now. We'll call it monkeypox, but uh, but we weren't prepared. And when you hear that our national strategic stockpile had vaccine in it that expired, um, that's troubling. That's very troubling. However. Um, that being said, I think California is doing everything it can to get as many doses in arms of the people who are the most susceptible as quickly as we can, as soon as those, as more and more vaccine becomes available. So I think in California, we're, we're, we're ahead of the game. Uh, we're, we're working hard at it, but you can't put vaccines in people if you don't have the vaccines to put in people. And that's, that's a huge source of frustration for us right now. I would just add, you know, just more recently, um, another concern is uh, polio, of all things, you know, which has all but been eradicated worldwide, set, worldwide, worldwide, excuse me, suddenly you're seeing polio uh, showing up in wastewater in New York City, and that is really, really troubling. As a dentist who practiced for many, many years, had a lot of patients over the years who had uh, survived polio. And, um, and what I saw, what, how, how crippled they were and how, how that affected their lives. And then the secondary uh, post-polio syndrome that they, they often got later in life uh, was really, really devastating. So um, the fact that here we are, we thought we had really all but eradicated polio in this country to see that one come back 
and there are generations of people who have no idea uh, about anything about polio and it's an oral vaccine. You know, it is, it is a sim so simple to do yet, yet here it comes and my goodness, um, that's, that's really, really scary, quite frankly. That is a perfect example of the consequences of not stepping up to our individual responsibilities because things can go from very good to very bad with all of this. Remember a lot of the premise around the vaccine for measles and, and a lot of these, the more people that are vaccinated, the better the population does. So that herd immunity concept applies to all of these viruses. And so it's really, really important that we get more and more people to vaccinate on all of these these diseases. They have real life consequences and people die from them. And we need to think about that in, for our own lives, but also those around us who are most vulnerable, who may not be able to get a vaccine. That's that personal responsibility that we hope that people step up to. That was Assemblymember Jim Wood, Chair of the Assembly Health Committee. I also would like to thank Dr. Robert Wachter, Chair of the Department of Medicine for UC San Francisco, Dr. Shira Shafir, epidemiologist with the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. I'm Pablo Espinosa with Look West, and of course, thank you for listening. The Look West podcast is produced by California Assembly Democrats. When you think of Californian politics, remember to look west. 